Hello everyone and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Emily Manning and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Courthouse Steps Oral Argument for Corner Post Inc. versus Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. We're joined today by Michael Bushbacher, partner at Boyd and Gray, John Kendrick, Associate at Covington, Professor Susan C. Morse, Professor of Law at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law, Molly Nixon, Separation of Powers Attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, and our moderator today is Professor John F. Duffy, Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federal Society. With that, thank you for joining us today, and Professor Duffy, the floor is yours. Well, today we're talking about, I think, a very interesting administrative law case that some uh, articles in the popular media media have called a real sleeper case uh, for this term. Um, I'll talk about why it's important, but let's first figure out what exactly is at issue. One of the things that's taught in standard administrative law is when plaintiffs can sue, and usually we focus on the beginning of the time when people can sue. That we know that they have to have final agency action. Uh, there's case law saying that uh, the action has to be ripe, um, and they have to have standing. So all those things usually are what lawyers worry about. They worry about starting uh, uh, how early they can sue. Very little attention is given to how late they can sue. Indeed, the APA does not address this issue seemingly at all. Um, it creates a cause of action, but it doesn't have within it its own statute of limitations. Um, instead, the courts, the lower courts, have borrowed a statute of limitations, a general statute of limitations that applies for all suits against the United States. And that statute says that, and I'm going to quote it because that is the crucial statute that's at issue here, says every civil action commenced against the United States shall be barred unless the complaint is filed within six years after the right of action first accrues. That, that last phrase, uh, six years after the right of action first accrues, that's the crucial uh, language that's at issue in this case. Um, the case in this particular case has a, a fairly straightforward timeline. Um, and the question is going to be, uh, is, the, uh, is this lawsuit challenging some rather old regulations um, untimely? Um, the, the timeline here is fairly straightforward. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in 2011 published a regulation known in the litigation as Regulation 2 um, that governs what are called inter-exchange fees or more commonly called swipe fees. These are fees that retailers have to pay to banks every time one of their customers swipes a credit card, pardon me, a debit card to um to make a payment in the uh, in the uh, in the retail business. Now, at the time this regulation was uh, promulgated, um, a trade association called the National Association of Convenience Stores and some others um, sought judicial review almost right away. Um, the challengers won in the D in the District Court of the District of Columbia, and then they lost the next year in 2014 uh, in the D.C. Circuit. The Supreme Court in 2015 denied cert. Um, the board issued a clarification, slight clarification in 2015. And then nothing really happened for many years. Um, in 2021, however, a trade association in North Dakota uh, moved to challenge the rule. And the Board of Governors said, this is too late. Um, you existed back in 2011. This is 10 years later. And uh, the statute of limitations for you is only six years, so you're many years too late. Um, upon the filing of that motion to dismiss, uh, another plaintiff was added, and that's Corner Post Incorporated. This is a corporation that was only created in 2017. 
So their argument is we could not have uh, had our cause of action accrue more than six years ago because we're four years old. We're a, a juvenile um, corporation. We just were created. Uh, so we're four years old. We can't have uh, we can't be time barred. Corner Post lost on that argument, both in the district court and on the and the Eighth Circuit. Uh, in 2023, they sought certiorari. They got certiorari. Um, argument was just held yesterday. Um, and the positions of the two parties, the, the petitioner, the private party, the small business, um, and the government, very straightforward, very radically different. Petitioner's position is, look, this statute of limitations has to be analyzed first by examining the petitioner's cause of action. Um, and that right, the right of this one petitioner, could not have first accrue um, until this plaintiff had the right and the ability to commence it. Um, under that theory, Corner Post wins uh, because they could not have sued prior to 2017 because they didn't exist prior to 2017. So they're well within the six-year period when they were added to this lawsuit in 2021. Um, the government's position is also equally straightforward to describe. Their position is the cause of action first accrues at the time of final agency action because, and I'm quoting from their brief here, any proper plaintiff can assert the right of action established by the Administrative Procedure Act. Note the government's position does not focus on this plaintiff, um, and it does not necessarily require that there be any proper plaintiff who could sue at the time of fi final agency action. Their position is it always runs from final agency action. That was 2011, and therefore, this case, which was filed in 2021, is years late because it was filed 10 years after the agency action. Um, so that's the two positions. I'm going to turn it over now to Molly Nixon, who's going to give us a little recap about what happened yesterday at the oral argument and perhaps even read the tea leaves just a tiny bit. Uh, thank you, Professor Duffy. Um so yeah, I did, um, you know, I've been following this case for a while, listened to the oral argument uh, yesterday. I had hoped after listening to it that I would have some sense of where the court was. Uh, and to be honest, I, I don't know um, how, the, how the case will go based on the oral argument. Uh, so I figured I would make a few observations um, and uh, perhaps the other panelists will, will respond uh, either in their, in their opening remarks or in the question and answer segment. Um, but so first, uh, I kind of saw the argument as breaking down in, into three different buckets, um, sort of the, the textual analysis of the, of the statutes that we're looking at, um, then a, a second one of sort of a, a fairness and, and norms um, bucket, and then a third one, which a lot of the justices focused on, were uh, the consequences of a decision either way. Um, on text, and I, I guess... To start off with, I was actually surprised at how little of the argument focused on the the text of the of the statutes. Um, but Justice Jackson did seem to be interested in um, a point that the government, I believe, made in its briefs about whether um, the petitioner was was conflating the elements of a claim um, with the with the who can sue or the elements of a cause of action with who can sue. Um, so she did dig a little bit in her question of, of both advocates, I believe, um, on that question. Um, and then Justices Alito and Gorsuch um, both seemed a bit skeptical of um, the um, concept of tying the definition of accrual to uh, context. Um, uh, they both seem to indicate, or at least had questions about whether the, the word accrue just o should always mean the same thing. Um, and then in the second bucket, um, the sort of norms of law, how we usually do things, in, not in the APA context, but in, in the United States justice system and, and fairness overall. Um, you know, Justice Roberts, I think, came down on both sides of this question, uh, starting off early on saying, you know, uh, these regulations, they, they set the ground rules for the regulatory regimes. That's, there's this um, inherent norm or fairness element there. Uh, and then later on, when he was questioning the government, um, you know, seemed uh, baffled that this uh, 
this hadn't been decided long ago and, and doesn't everyone get their day in court and what are we, what are we doing here? Uh, it, it seems very strange that, that a plaintiff could um, be entirely barred in this way when they didn't exist at the time the regulation was issued. Um, you know, I think also going so far, the government responded to that and, and pointed to a number of statutes of repose that uh, that Congress had passed. And the Chief Justice at, at one point said, well, well, maybe they're all illegal <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, so definitely some, some fairness um, concepts at play. Uh, Justice Sotomayor made um, another point on the other side of that saying, um, it, I, I kind of thought of it as the, the coming to the nuisance point. Of, um, you know, the ground rules, they exist. If you start up a business, uh, you're, you're, you're sort of coming into it knowing knowing what you're getting. Um, it's, uh, I think, in, I don't know if these were her words, but it seems a bit rich to turn around and then say uh, you didn't like the ground rules that you accepted upon you know, um, filing for incorporation or something like that. Um, and then on the the sort of consequences bucket, which is where a lot of the um, discussion focused um, I think Justice Kagan seemed particularly concerned about this. Um, she raised the point uh, uh, or the question about whether um, doesn't this wouldn't this just create an incentive to for a trade association to start almost a shell or a sham business to challenge a new regulation whenever they found one they wanted to challenge and were otherwise time barred. Um, Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson both uh, talked about whether the court's um, pending decision um, in local right and relentless on um, the Chevron doctrine, whether that would have any impact on um, uh, the sort of opening the, the floodgates argument the government made. Um, and Justice Jackson also, um, I think, most directly asked about something that a lot of the justices seem to be thinking about, which is the stability of the regulatory world that, that we all operate in. Um, so those are those are kind of the three the three buckets that I said as I say that the conversation moved around. Um, one thing I was particularly interested in, um, and maybe I'd love to hear from the other panelists on this, but it seemed to me that the the court was particularly interested in consequences, and not surprisingly so. And it, um, I thought both advocates did uh, an excellent job, but they both seemed. I would have thought they would have had pat answers on the consequences, and and both times it kind of veered off into well we don't we don't know this and we don't know that, which I think is true. Um, you know the, the, that's a perfectly accurate argument, but um, or response. But I, I was a bit surprised by that. Um, I guess secondly, um, I wanted to talk just a bit about what didn't really come up in oral argument, um, and the first one I mentioned was a real grappling with the statutory text um, that that didn't seem to be what most justices were focused on. Um, they did talk a lot about, um, you know, as I said, consequences, fairness, um, and maybe that goes to um, whether Congress intended either, either outcome, um, whether that's a reasonable interpretation of Congress's intent. Um, but with with a few exceptions, the justices just didn't seem to be wanting to, wanting to delve into the, the text very much. Um, there was an interesting point raised in the government's briefs and at the end of oral argument about how the focus was really on rules and the uh, attorney for the government said, you know, this is not just rules, the, this would have the applications and permits and, and denials of permits. Um, and that, that really opens up the scope of what we're talking about. And uh, I would suggest this did not seem particularly interested in pursuing that. Um, one question that I've had um, following this case um, that, that no one seemed to talk about was uh, how, how would this work for individuals? Um, so we're talking about, about businesses and, and um, you know, you incorporate after a rule is, prom is issued, promulgated, uh, how does that affect you? How does it work for individuals? So if you um, want to challenge a, uh, a land use regulation in Colorado, um, how and you live in Wyoming, Where, when does your injury accrue um, for, for challenging that? Uh, but it, that didn't really come up on at all. Um, and finally, um, I was looking or, or listening to the oral argument, I was really trying to see if there was any interest, whether it shed light on whether there was interest for a narrow uh, opinion of some sort. Um, 
and I have to say I did not uh, get a strong <laughs> impression that way. It, it seemed to me that the, the three um, generally more liberal justices, uh, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Jackson, uh, were pretty, seemed pretty solid in their um, support for the government's position here. Uh, I didn't get a lot of sense that they were um, grappling with the fairness element uh, or that, that was, uh, they saw that as an appropriate question to be asking here. Um, and then from the other, the six other justices, I, I didn't really get a sense either way. Um, I'm not what great one for reading tea leaves. Um, so take this all with a giant grain of salt. But I, I kind of thought that the, as I said, three liberal justices seem to be uh, in favor of the government. Um, in terms of um, justices leaning toward corner post position, I thought uh, my read on the argument was that Justice Gorsuch seemed uh, favorable to their position. Uh, and that if I had to you know, say, I would say Alito, Justices Alito and Chief Justice Roberts also seemed um, sympathetic, uh, at least. Uh, and then as, as far as I could tell, and I'm very open to hearing from the other panelists on this, Justice Thomas didn't, didn't tip his hand at all. Uh, and Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett seemed very, very interested and had a lot of questions for both for both sides, um, but but in my view, I didn't I didn't see where either their questions or the the answers to those uh, landed in terms of uh, outcome or how a narrow opinion could be crafted here. Um, so that's that's all from me, and I, I look forward to hearing from from the other panelists. Uh, thank thanks Molly, and um, thanks to Emily for the introduction and the whole FedSoc team for organizing this event. Um, I'm here today really because 10 years ago I asked Professor Duffy for a note topic. Uh, he told me about this arcane statute that had apparently been misinterpreted by a lot of courts. I wrote my note on the topic, gained some traction, and uh, here we are. Um, before getting into the case, just two preliminary points. Obviously, I'm speaking here today in my personal capacity. I don't speak for Covington or Burling. I don't speak for any Covington clients. Um, also, I'm in my day job, I'm an antitrust lawyer. I'm not an administrative lawyer, not an appellate lawyer. Uh, my expertise in administrative law, if you can call it that, is really just confined to the issues in this case. Uh, but luckily, we have lots of other very qualified panelists uh, here today, so I think we'll be able to get through it. So uh, with those preliminary points out of the way, just a few thoughts on the Corner Post case, and particularly the text, and, and on yesterday's argument. So starting with the text, um, yeah, I agree with, with Molly that the argument didn't really focus very much on the text. And frankly, I just think that's because the text is, is so clear. So there wasn't much to say. Um, a plaintiff's claim just can't accrue until that specific plaintiff uh, can sue. And a lot of times that lines up with when the defendant acted, but that's not always true. And the word accrue, um, and, and at least in the statute of limitations context, has had this sort of plaintiff focused meaning going back to the 1800s. Um, as, as Justice Gorsuch so colorfully said, uh, that, that historical meaning is just encrusted uh, on 2401A. Um, and it's not just historical cases either, right? I think, you know, more recent cases interpreting the word accrue also take a plaintiff-focused approach. You know, I'm not really aware of any case um, where the word accrue has been interpreted the way the government is, is suggesting here. Um, and, and back to the argument, it seemed like everyone sort of agreed that was the starting point, at least. You know, I think even Justice Kagan acknowledged that's kind of the default rule, this, this um, plaintiff-focused approach. And I think that's kind of why maybe the argument wasn't as focused as much on the text. Um, and so that means the case really comes down to whether there's a good reason uh, to depart from, from the default rule in this case. And um, I thought I saw things similar to the way Molly did. I think it you, know, you can really categorize the government's responses, their attempts to get around the default rule um, two ways. I think uh, one of their main arguments was pointing to other statutes in the administrative context with with different limitations periods that are key to final agency action. And the government sort of made the argument that um, those statutes mean that uh, that is the default presumption, at least in the administrative context for limitations periods. They should always run from final agency action. Um, the problem as I see it, and as I think some of the justices saw it, is that uh, all those other statutes, they don't use the word accrue. You know, they, they point to the issuance of the regulation or the promulgation. So I think, in, in fact, all those other statutes really cut against the government. What they show is that, that Congress uses words other than accrue uh, when it wants to draft a time limit that's based on, on agency action. 
So then I, I think the second main uh, sort of species of arguments that the government made, it's really, it was just policy, right? That, um, that the petitioner, that the plaintiff focused interpretation of a crew would just open the floodgates to APA suits challenging a lot of settled regulations. Um, I think at the argument that the liberal leaning justices seemed to really sympathetic to that concern. Um, but of course, as Molly said, right there, there's equities on the other side too, right? It, it doesn't seem fair to say that your claim accrued before you even existed. You know, people in that situation uh, never get their day in court, right? You know, I'm sorry, I thought this was America. I get my day in court. And I think the chief and some of the other conservative justices seemed a lot more focused on that concern. Um, so then, I mean, it just comes down to how do you weigh those concerns? How do you weigh the opening the floodgates, the cost of that versus this presumption that individuals get their day in court? Um, and for weighing that, there's there's no rule that a court can apply to weigh those two things, right? It's really a policy judgment. And if you're a textualist, then you don't really think courts should be making a uh, policy judgment like that. That's Congress's job. And I think that brings us back to where we started, the text, right? You know, the, the co Congress's policy judgment is reflected in the text they chose, and they chose the, the word accrue. Um, you know, that said, I think, you know, people can have different approaches to statutory interpretation. And, you know, if you're not as much of a textualist, I could see why maybe the, the context from the other administrative limitations provisions uh, would cut in favor of the government's approach, or why maybe you would be more concerned with the floodgates argument. Um, but I think that's sort of what it comes down to is just your interpretive approach. Um, as for tea leaves, again, I'm not an appellate lawyer, but I think just based on what I said and how I think it's really a question of, of one's interpretive approach, I think it'll just it'll be a straightforward six to three case. I think the six the six more uh, textless conservative judges justices will rule for the petitioner and take the the plaintiff focused interpretation, and then the three more liberal justices will dissent. Um, and then I guess one last parting thought. I just from a pure like politics angle, I think a lot of times uh, it's important to remember that a lot of the, a lot of the plaintiffs who are trying to bring these administrative challenges are actually sort of like left leaning plaintiffs, right? There's cases where environmental groups and others um, were, were challenging regulations as insufficiently protective of the environment, and you know they they have gotten blocked by this rule and this statute. Um, you know I've I've had lawyers who are representing immigrants and asylum petitions contact me about making this sort of argument in their cases too, right? Because um, uh, immigration regulations may be having an impact on their case and they may be time barred from challenging them. So I just sort of want to make sure we keep that in mind too and resist the typical left-right uh, framing of, of this case. And with that, I will pass the mic. <clears throat> Fine, I'm going to introduce uh, our next speaker is Professor Morris from the University of Texas, another flagship state uh, university law school, um, which of course are the best kind of, of law schools. I think she and I will agree on that. Me too, um, I agree. And, and, and uh, John Kendrick will too, being uh, one of our great graduates uh, of this law school. Um, Professor Morris, among her other accomplishments, has recently published, and I mean really recently, just a few months ago, may even be two months ago, uh, an article on this very topic. She must have started the project before this case was granted cert because um, it uh, it it could not be written that quickly unless she's far faster a writer than I am. Um, I love the title too. It's called Old Regs. Uh, I like that, all short for old regulations, which is really what's at issue here in this case. And I think she has one of the best formulations about the rule and I'll read it to you. I think, and I think the government actually sort of channeled her a little in the oral argument. I thought the government had not really focused too much on the text. Um, she writes, pursuant to the APA, a cause of action arises at promulgation of the or other final agency action and then exists and continues, waiting on change for an eligible plaintiff to come along and raise the claim. I think that is one way to look at the text, that the, that the cause of action sort of accrues, meaning it arises, but then you, and then it's a completely different issue to uh, have an eligible plaintiff who can come along and take advantage of that, of that cause of action. And she draws on, among other things, she has a expertise in tax law. She draws and gives a nice example in tax law that oftentimes 
The Anti-Injunction Act prohibits uh, people from raising facial challenges uh, to tax regulations. And she says, even in that context, um, the cause of action accrues, meaning it arises uh, at the time of promulgating the regulation. So she takes on this, I think, hard hypothetical that the, the cause of action could arise and accrue when no one can sue. She takes that on in her article um, straight away and, and sort of gives the, the other side its due on this hard hypothetical. With that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to her. She can probably explain her position much better and also perhaps give her view of what the uh, how the argument went yesterday for the government. Well, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I have indeed been thinking about the statute for a while. Um, I understand not quite as many years as some others on the panel, but it's uh, it was a kind of a, a neat experience to see it come up at the court yesterday. Um, I, uh, I agree with the government, basically, or with the result that the government seeks. I quibble with some of its reasoning, um, which I'll mention as um, I go through a couple of remarks here. Uh, but that's um, the basic outlook that I have. Uh, I thought that I, I had a three bucket way of shaping the argument too. The buckets are uh, overlap in some ways, but not perfectly. My three buckets are text, precedent, and policy. Um, and uh, I think that one thing that thread through the argument for me on the text side was the idea that first accrues means when the claim arises, when all the elements of the claim are present and the plaintiff being able to sue is just not part of that. I thought that Justice Kagan came again, back to that again and again um, through the course of the argument. And I'm not sure that any, uh, any justice really contested that, um, that idea. In some sense, in order to open up that analysis, what had to happen was that um, there had to be a, uh, an acknowledgement that a crew can depend on context. And I think that the justices settled on that at their oral argument, that the precedent of Crown Coat, for example, was essentially argued to a draw, which basically opens up the possibility for the court to decide the question of what first a cruise means um, based on uh, on precedent and on policy, as well as the text. In other words, they've made this textual analysis open and available. The government received an unexpected assist in its definition or its explanation of first accrued from a textualist perspective, as first arises, all the elements of the claim are present, even if the plaintiff is not yet identified, by the petitioners themselves in their reply brief, because they conceded somewhat unexpectedly, I think, that for some kinds of procedural claims, specifically notice and comment violations, they say likely that claim does accrue at the time of promulgation. And it seems to me that once they have made that concession, they have made the textual concession that is necessary for the court to produce the result, to come to the decision that first accrues means first arises all elements of the claim are present, because, of course, in a notice and comment claim, also, it is the case that what's available for the claim at the time of promulgation is the elements of the claim, the administrative record, you didn't consider a comment, the preamble was not sufficient in its response, and so forth. But that doesn't mean that a plaintiff is available for a notice and comment claim. So uh, that, I think, was a really important logic step and is really going to help um, the government's argument in this case, assuming the court um, is uh, attentive and, and cares about that concession. There was some evidence that they did. Once you are there with the notice and comment claim, the other two pieces of the argument, which happen to track the two claims that Corner Post makes, one, that the regulation was arbitrary and capricious, and second, an ultra vires claim that it exceeded the statutory authority, follow along, it seems to me, the same textual analysis. Because once the textual analysis is there for notice and comment, it is basically the same textual analysis for arbitrary and capricious and for ultra viras. At the time of promulgation, all of the information is there to decide whether or not a claim, excuse me, the regulations arbitrary and capricious, the claim just sits there waiting for the eligible plaintiff to, uh, to come along. Um, and similarly with a facial claim about in excess of statutory authority. 
So I think that that's kind of you know where I I see that um, that textual piece of the of the argument, um, and I want to move on to um, to the second idea, which is precedent. This was a very interesting one I thought at argument yesterday. Um, one of the very first interactions that petitioners counsel had with Justice Thomas was to me very telling with respect to precedent. Thomas asked and asked repeatedly, basically, is there a case that you can give me where a court has arrived at the result that the petitioners seek? There was no such case. The petitioners could not produce one. Um, the best they can come up with is this her case in the Sixth Circuit. But her doesn't really say what the petitioners want the court to decide in this case. In other words, even though this was really stressed at briefing, and here I, I think the government made an error in accepting this characterization. I, I don't think there's a circuit split. And the government um, sort of kind of suggested that it maybe it thought there was, and then the petitioners ran with that. But the thing about the Her case is that um, it is a case that doesn't involve an ultra virus claim, doesn't involve uh, a, uh, a, a, a Chevron claim as, as the um, corner post case does. Instead, it really involves a claim that a federal regulation has violated a state property right. And in addition, it's just this close to being an as applied claim because the federal agency sent a letter saying that it was going to enforce in her, even though it didn't actually stop it was a motorboat case, stop the motorboat on the lake and try to assess a fine. So it's really just not the same kind of case. So we don't have a circuit split, I don't think in this case, let alone a broad and deep circuit split of the kind that would allow the government, uh, excuse me, the, the court to um, uh, appreciate the different viewpoints developed in the lower courts. The overwhelming weight of precedent uh, here is in the government's favor. It's even true as a, uh, the uh, Solicitor General uh, po uh, his office, the representative pointed out yesterday um, that uh, even district courts in the Sixth Circuit are not reading her to require accrual at the time, uh, at the later time when the plaintiff acquires standing, uh, the very same regulation um, uh, uh, was time barred as far as a challenge goes in a, in the, in a case involving a pizzeria, which the government pointed out um, yesterday. So that brings me to my third bucket, which is policy. Um, I agree completely with um, Ms. Nixon's approach of uh, contrasting the two things that were going on in the case as far as policy. On the one hand, fairness, that is that a plaintiff should have its day in court. On the other hand, the question of consequences or stability in the law. Um, and so uh, the issue with um, those two things and contrasting them, I think is important. The government had a nice example on the stability in law point, um, which uh, had to do with the, this example of someone visiting a dam for the first time and being sad that the dam had been erected despite their um, interest in uh, uh, seeing the snail darter or something like that, some kind of um, uh, 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 well, wildlife or endangered species concern perhaps. Um, this question of land use and land use stability is really important. It's not just tens of thousands of dams, but also tens of thousands of roads and other land improvements that have been approved through various administrative actions, um, doubtless some with procedural foot faults, and th that will be presumably open to challenge if the government um, uh, uh, rules in favor of the petitioners. Indeed, this whole area of case law began with two decisions relating to uh, land use orders issued by the Bureau of Land Management in the 60s and 70s. Um, so I think that the stability of law point is an important one. I also agree that the access to court point is an important one. And here I want to make two points that I kind of wish that the had been emphasized a bit more in the government's presentation, because I think that what the government says about um, the, the very limited access to court in as applied actions, which of course under prevailing case law arise, um, the, the statute of limitations accrues later for as applied actions, not for administrative procedure claims, but for ultra vires claims. Um, 
So uh, the as applied avenue to court, I think, is a little bit broader than the government claimed. The government suggested it had to proceed from an enforcement action. But there actually are examples of cases where a plaintiff can get into court, even though the government action does not directly impact them. A key Supreme Court precedent here is Allen v. Wright. Standing didn't exist in that case. But there's been found in other cases where there's a sufficiently close causal link between a regulation and a third party's action. So a nice example is um, uh, a couple of cases where um, uh, male athletes who were aggrieved by Title IX substantial proportionality guidance in the 1990s, their teams were cut, wrestling teams, for example, or swimming teams, and they sued their universities. Um, uh, and they also, in some cases, were able to join the Department of Education. The theory was that it was really the Department of Education substantial proportionality safe harbor, harbor guidance that had caused the universities to cut the teams. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily impossible for a, a plaintiff like Corner Post to get the Federal Reserve into court um, on an as-applied basis. Um, I do think that we'll have to work a little harder to do it. Final point, also with respect to uh, possibly an expanded route to getting to court is equitable tolling. So this used to be an issue of some um, controversy uh, in terms of whether 2401A was subject to equitable tolling and other equitable exceptions. Um, now I think that is largely resolved, although the Supreme Court has not ruled squarely on it um, after a 1990 precedent, uh, Irwin, which interpreted a related statute. And so here the point is, if it is the case that, for example, the government's um, misconduct or uh, a particular action taken by the government um, in some way prevents a plaintiff from suing who would otherwise be eligible, then equitable tolling could provide relief or you know, uh, equity. I think um, I, I, I'm in the group of people that thinks that um, equity is going to become more and more important at the Supreme Court and federal courts. And this may be an example of where um, it does what equity has always been meant to do, which is to provide um, adjustments in appropriate cases. Thank you so much again for including me in this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, I actually just want to ask you one follow-up question because we've got one more minute, which is um, you, you talked a lot about whether there's a circuit split. Do you think there's any chance that the court will dig this case, dismisses improvidently granted, or do you think that perhaps what the Chief Justice said, like, this is pretty fundamental. It should have been decided a long time ago. We really, you know, do, they, do you think they're going to decide or do you think they might just say, well, we look closer. There's not a circuit split. Maybe we shouldn't decide it. I wish they hadn't granted it. And I think they do too. On the other hand, a dig is an acknowledgement that their process for accepting cases has imperfections and they should have been able to see perhaps that there wasn't at least a clean and deep circuit split in the beginning. So I don't know that I'm enough of a court roger to really predict, but I feel like that would be the trade-off. Yeah, I think they'd never admit that the process for cert that's run mainly by law clerks just a few years out of law school, that that has any imperfections whatsoever. I, I think that they would not want to even hint that. Um, our uh, third panelist is Michael Bushbacher, who is an appellate lawyer. We've had people disclaim uh, being appellate lawyers, but he is an appellate lawyer. And uh, he also is a, is a graduate of Notre Dame Law School, if I'm correct about that, um, yeah. which I had the uh, great fortune to teach as a visitor last year there. So I, I think it's Absolutely. a wonderful uh, law school and great place to get your education, certainly as a uh, a an, uh, former Irish Catholic altar boy, I thought it was a highlight of my career to, to have a ID from the University of Notre Dame. So I'll turn it over to you as our appellate expert. Well, I'm Dutch Reformed, so that was an interesting experience in other ways, though I loved it. Um, I, I want to take off uh, uh, what Susie was just talking about with, um, with the point about equity. Uh, and I have thoughts on some of our other other points as well that I'll get to. But I, I, I think there's, lurking in the background here, a very interesting uh, issue uh, about the scope of equitable relief. So uh, the rule is, you know, if you're in equity, you're talking about latches. And there's equitable tolling, which is an extension of sexual limitations. But 
you're in the you're in the land of uh, of equity, you get uh, latches. If you're in the land of law, you get a statute of limitations. And one of the things that's very interesting to me about the argument is how much uh, kind of confusion about what was Congress thinking, trying to figure that out. And if you look even closer, it's very strange the sort of saga that gets you here. Going back to uh, this statute, you know, the Little Tucker Act, where the statute of limitations comes from, originally codified in the 19th century, was recodified in the 40s with a few little tweaks. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that's right around the same time that the APA was enacted. And you would think, like, these would be coming up all the time together, but they don't. They don't, no one even thought to apply 2401A to a APA pre-enforcement claim until the 80s. I looked for this, the earliest cases I could find were from the 80s, which is very strange. And then when you read the, you know, the quintessential cases about pre-enforcement review, like Abbott Labs, like the, the same complaints we heard the government talking about with the floodgates and the challenges of being the, uh, the best funded and best resourced litigant in the world um, uh, by being the federal government, they, they, they said the same thing back in Abbott Labs, right? So this is 1967, right? The, the, the Supreme Court says, you know, if, if the government the Solicitor General raises uh, complaints that if you allow non-statutory review here, quote, permitting, uh, they will permit resort to the courts in this type of case and may delay or impede effective enforcement and lead to a multiplicity of suits in various jurisdictions challenging other regulations. And the court said, that's not a problem. It's an equitable suit, right? The declaratory judgment action, and it's subject to equitable uh, uh, protections uh, for abusive litigation, including they explicitly say latches. Now, no, now, no one applies latches to this kind of thing anymore. And what I think happened is is a, a strange change elsewhere in the APA, kind of shifted focus uh, in a way that that changed the ultimate um, kind of way people think about this. Uh, and, and that is getting rid of um, uh, sovereign immunity uh, in the APA and also the uh, changes in, um, uh, in the Federal Tort Claims Act that, that got rid of the idea of suits against the United States, right? The United States historically is protected by sovereign immunity as a litigant. The individual officers were not. You could sue an individual officer. This is the ex parte Young case, many other cases following on this. And, and they say, look, if you are acting outside of your legal authority, you're just subject to suit. You can't claim the mantle of sovereign immunity. And just look at the captions of cases that, have, you know, that, that talk about this, right? It's, it's not Abbott Labs versus United States. It's Abbott Labs versus Gardner. By contrast, the Crown Coat uh, Front Co case, that is versus the United States, right? That's a, it, was a, it was a claim. It was a money claim, a contract claim. Uh, and so that's why 2401A applied. So that distinction's fallen into desuetude with the, the changes to the federal statutes governing federal tort claims and sovereign immunity in the APA context. But I think it still actually has a lot uh, of uh, meaning here. Now, this isn't something the court got into, um, and it's not necessary because the parties agreed that this was a suit against the United States. Uh, on the theory, I think that the, the Federal uh, Reserve Board is an instrumentality that's functionally equivalent to the U.S. But I think that distinction does matter. And it brings me to the second point, which is the, um, uh, the phrase in the, in the statute, and I think this is something that didn't get enough attention yesterday. It's, it's not when something first accrues, when like a it's when a, the right of action first accrues. And the notion push back a little on, on, on Professor Morse's point, the notion that something can accrue as a right in the abstract makes no sense to me unless you're talking about some kind of public right, something that accrues to the public at large. But there is no case, I don't think there's anything in, in Professor Morse's article, certainly nothing in the government's brief or anything they pointed out at argument that interpreted accrue and right of action in that kind of way. Um, but to get back to my equity point, I think the, the right of action also uh, has another little clue to, to the meaning of 2401A that I think folks have missed. And that is that a right of action is a, is a, is a, a right to obtain a property, money, chattel, that kind of thing. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as a chose in action. Uh, the Her case actually in a different section has a very nice discussion of this. 
uh, by Judge Sutton. And uh, the notion that a, uh, a APA pre-enforcement suit involves that kind of right makes very little sense. What you actually do in a pre-enforcement suit is you raise an affirmative defense in advance, right? You say, look, if you were to apply this regulation to me, my affirmative defense would be your regulation is invalid. And the ex parte young theory applied to pre-enforcement review in administrative law is that you can bring that affirmative defense as a pre-enforcement claim. A little odd to have it come up in a case, corner post, that doesn't involve any potential enforcement because it is a, a someone who's an object of the regulation but who has is never going to be the subject of enforcement. Banks get to set these uh, uh, swipe fees and then these folks have to have to pay them, um, and the the cap is set by uh, by the government. Uh, but in any event, um, I th I think that the court got it right back in Abbott Labs, and I do think it is a a strange move uh, to have applied 2401A across the board to APA suits. I think a lot of the puzzles and head scratching things from yesterday's argument come down to it just kind of evolved in this weird way. Uh, a few other thoughts um, on on the argument, um, you know, that the notion that there's some kind of textual uh, basis that you could plausibly argue for the government's position. I think Justice Jackson's question where she tried to make this point shows why it doesn't work. She said, just because it says the cause of action accrues doesn't make it an accrual based statute. It's a direct quote. I mean, like statutes either mean things or they don't and it's fine if you think that they should mean different things depending on what you want but that that the notion that accrual is somehow being uh plaintiff focused accrual is somehow being sort of projected onto the statute from outside i think is just very hard to defend um and uh, i guess I'll, I'll close with uh one very interesting point probably to me the most interesting part of argument i thought argument wasn't actually that interesting but justice kavanaugh said uh, what the remedy? What remedy uh, is appropriate here? It, it, because it seems like in order to get what they wanted, you're going to have to vacate the rule and set it aside, and so it doesn't apply to anybody, um, because it applies to these folks only indirectly. And the government's not challenging standing, and so that led the government's lawyer to make a rather odd concession, where he said, even though they've been saying vacater is not a thing, uh, th th to say, well, in some circumstances. Maybe vacater is what's uh, potentially necessary to get relief under the APA. And Justice Kavanaugh said, well, that's a plot twist. Of course, the response was, I didn't intend that as a plot twist, which I thought was hilarious. Um, so the, the, the upshot of, of this case, I think, plays into a bigger debate about uh, what the APA remedies are. Because I don't think most folks would have any problem with uh, following the text if all you had was some plaintiff specific kind of relief where, hey, look, why should you have to wait for an enforcement action and defend against it? You can just do what you happen to next party young as long as you meet the normal requirements. That seems very normal and fair to me, at least, and, and in accordance with the text. It seems to me all of the difficulty here arises because of the scope of the remedies that are available under the APA, at least as currently uh, interpreted. So how this ties into all those things and what the court ends up doing is to me gonna be very interesting. And I also hope, uh, though, you know, it didn't come up in an argument, and I'm sure they didn't read my amicus brief, but I do hope that uh, this idea of um, equity and uh, that latches might apply to officer suits under the APA, um, that that gets left open for another day, because I think it's a very interesting question. Yes, and uh, we have 20 minutes now for moderated discussion uh, before we get to the questions. I might start uh, getting moving questions from the audience into the discussion, too. I do want to say, I think this is, because I teach ad law, I think administrative law, I, I think this is just a fascinating case because it, it links up a whole bunch of other issues. In fact, one of the things I think is most fascinating about this case, and I try to instill in my students in administrative law, that there's a big difference between suing the officers and suing the agency, which is what is named as the uh, the defendant in this case, they sued the Board of Governors, not any officers. With respect to the officers, historically, uh, first of all, for the first 30 years of the Administrative Procedure Act, you had to sue the officers. If you made the mistake of either suing the agency by name, which is part of the government, or the government, the United States, by name, you got your case dismissed on sovereign immunity grounds. This, the APA was amended in 1976 to change that, as Michael mentioned. Uh, 
um, the 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 lead person at the Justice Department uh, for that change was Antonin Scalia, then uh, uh, an on leave professor from the University of Virginia, which I, I think is very interesting. Um, the uh, and that led to that's the reason why this statute never got applied before the 1980s. Uh, I'd look to. You don't see these, this issue arising until after the 1976 amendment because no one would think that an APA suit was against the United States because if it was against the United States, it would get dismissed. Um, so it's a fascinating question about whether latches should still apply if you name the officers. I teach my students, and here's a little practical point that, that comes out of deep theory, I think, that always sue both. You know, we're in the United States, you know, you don't have to just sue one, you know, sue everybody, you know, sue it, grab them all and let, let God figure that out, you know, like sue it all. And, you know, you might have different options uh, based on the different parties in your suit. And, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And if it's latches, you know, I, I'm not sure latches reaches a different result in this case, but um, it might. Um, so, uh, and Professor Morris brought up those equity uh, points uh, too. Um, so uh, now I'm going to, um, let's see. So that's actually, I think part of that that uh, little exegesis there was about why the chief justice, in answer to the chief justice question about why it took 60 years, really hasn't taken 60 years. The first 30 this, uh, years of the, of the Administrative Procedure Act, this could not come up. And then uh, for the remainder of time, it's been sort of percolating in the lower courts as, as courts have tried to apply this uh, statute. Um, one thing about uh, the, a big deal, and I want to throw this out to all panelists, um, but especially Professor Morris, um, is that in the briefing and in the Sixth Circuit Her case, which I must say was written by um, a, a Judge Sutton, uh, and I think that might be why the court thought there's a circuit split. You know, multiple circuits versus Sutton, they they think that's a real circuit split because Sutton has such a, a reputation on the court. Um, so a lot was made about the difference between statutes of repose and statutes of accrual, accrual based statutes of limitations and repose. With the basic, I think, gist of this being that repose looks to the defendant's conduct and starts the time period running then, and accrual looks to the plaintiff's um, ability to sue and starts the time period running then. This case tries to, I think, blur that line quite a bit. And so I want to ask, maybe starting with Professor Morris, is that a, is that a distinction or is that distinction itself very, very blurry? Thanks for the question. Um, I think that the idea of statutes of repose versus statute of limitations is a valuable and good distinction. I also think that it arose out of um, concepts of private law, where the thing that produced the cause of action or produced the lawsuit was an interaction between two people, the plaintiff and the defendant. Of course, with the Tucker Act and other developments, that model of a transactional breach or a, a tortious encounter and so forth between a plaintiff and defendant has moved so that, of course, the government can now be a defendant in a suit just as a private party is. And in that binary context, it does make some sense to have a distinction between the two, that a statute of limitations would, um, is a, you know, one way you can describe uh, a limitations period that depends on when the plaintiff can sue and a statute of repose is a way of describing a limitations period, usually shorter, that depends on what the defendant did. Um, excuse me, usually longer is what I mean to say. It depends on what the defendant did um, when the defendant um, acted. But the thing about this is that it's um, it's about the action of an agency that could affect many people. I have thought a bit about this public rights question. And it does seem, and indeed there is language, not only in, for example, Wind River, but also in Sutton's opinion, in her, that is supportive of the idea that administrative procedure um, is a matter of public right. It's a, a democratic adjacent process that uh, promotes participation and tries to get to high quality rules for the sake of us all. 
And that is different from um, a situation where a lawsuit arises from between a plaintiff and defendant. And I think that that is the reason why the statute of repose, statute of limitation vocabulary um, is not um, adequate to the task in this case. John or Michael, either of you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I guess it, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I a couple of thoughts. Um, I guess getting, and this is related to what you just said in um, the earlier comments, I think, um, and the concession that that looks like they made, the petitioners made that this rule wouldn't apply to procedural claims. I think, it, and I think the concession, if I understand correctly, isn't necessarily that those claims accrued for everybody at the, at, at that time. It's more that um, plaintiffs that weren't in existence when the rule was promulgated just weren't harmed at all because the nature of the harm is, is lack of ability to participate in the in the in the process, right? And that they just would never have been able to participate anyway. Um, I also think in terms of like so blurriness and, and blurriness between when the defendant acted and when the plaintiff was harmed and, and the Crown Coat case. I mean, I, I think in that case, um, everyone was asking the same question. It was when when is the plaintiff harmed and what was blurry is sort of sorting through the facts and figuring out when exactly that was. But I, I think the legal meaning was clear. And, and what that quote means is just that it depending on different contexts, it can apply in different ways. <clears throat> Michael? Yeah, I'm not sure what's democratic about the agency rulemaking process, um, but insofar as it has a public aspect to it, I do agree with John that notice and comment injury, insofar as that's an injury, uh, if you're saying I should have been able to comment on something, but I didn't, well, that doesn't make any sense if you didn't exist, right? You can't say, that's how I, if they're saying something broader than that, I think I disagree with them. If they're just saying there are certain process injuries that happen through the administrative process, and those are, by their very nature, the kind of things that wrap up with final agency action, then that sounds right to me. Um, but that, again, is completely consistent with the notion that, that John and I have, have put forward in the brief that we did, and John put in his article, of a plaintiff-focused, harm-focused uh, uh, question uh, for the court to look at. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I would say, and and I must say, I, I also submitted an amicus brief on the side of the petitioners. So if you think I'm being an unbiased moderator, I, I do apologize for that. I, it's, it's hard. It's very difficult um, for me to be moderate. Um, you can ask any of my colleagues. Um, but I will say that I, I think that my view is with respect to statutes of repose and, and statutes of limitations, accrual-based statute of limitations, is that you know there is a range of meaning with respect to accrual, um, just like there's a range of meaning with respect to the word dog, right? You could have a chihuahua and you can have a German shepherd or an Irish wolfhound. Those are very, very different, but still there's uh, dog is not cat and, and there is a difference there. So I, I, I look at it that way, but um, maybe because I, I try to be a textualist, uh, that maybe that's the way I look at it. And that when the court in um, this earlier case was talking about the shades of meaning, I think it's more like, you know, that there are shades of meaning. We have to figure out when the action, when the plaintiff can, uh, can uh, sue. Um, but it, it's not, you can't sort of get all across that fundamental distinction. I, I read uh, Judge Sutton's opinion in the lower court, her case, the one that at least arguably created the circuit split, um, as, 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 as trying to sort of sharpen that, that distinction. Um, I do want to, uh, um, uh, John Kendrick raised uh, one issue that um, has come up in the audience questions too, and I want to give, it was directed to, um, Professor Morris, um, and I want to give her a chance to respond to both what John said and, and what our questioner from the audience, the question from the audience from Michael Showalter uh, is, uh, he, it's a statement, but I'll just put a question mark at the end of it. He said, petitioner did not concede that the right of action accrues before the injury in the notice and comment context, in other words, for procedural claims. The petitioner just said their client would have no injury in that in that case for that, you know, years ago violation. Um, so that's uh, so uh, at least uh, both John Kendrick and our and Michael Showalter and our audience uh, thinks that the concession wasn't quite what what you said it is. I want to give you a chance to respond to that, uh, Professor Morris. Oh, thank you. Um, so the the thing about a com a, a claim that notice and comment wasn't fo followed is that although it's true that the 
people who have the ability to notice and to, to submit comments and participate in notice and comment have to exist at the time of the rulemaking, there isn't any limitation in the APA that says that it's those people that can raise the claim that notice and comment isn't followed. You get to court through 706. It says, if the question is presented that an eligible plaintiff can claim that a regulation was made without observance of procedure required by law. And so what that means is that people who could comment can't always raise the claim in court. And also people who did not have the chance to comment can raise the claim in court. They're just not equivalent. Here's an example. And finally, I get to talk about tax, which of course makes me very happy. In tax, it is very typical for people to make comments on regulations that say, please government be tougher on this taxpayer. Please tighten this regulation. Please make them pay more tax. This is the right policy. If the government disregards this policy comment and makes the nice regulation that allows the taxpayer to pay less in tax, the person that wanted the good policy result in their view, pay more in tax, can never sue. And that's just the way the tax works is there's no general taxpayer standing. Hmm. You have to actually be injured. Similarly, on kind of on the other side, if it's the case that there's someone didn't have a chance to comment, but they come into being or are injured within the six years and they make some kind of claim challenging the regulation, they can make the notice and comment procedural challenge as part of their litany of things consistent with putting everything you can into your complaint along the notice and comments, no good. It's arbitrary and capricious. It's in violation of substantive uh, statute. And they all go kind of in the same place. So I don't really see that as relevant. I mean, to the extent it is relevant, there's no personalized injury from notice and comment. I mean, you don't like the reg. The injury is because you don't like the reg. You don't like the reg and it's a bad notice and comment thing. Well, that seems just as much of an injury as I don't like the reg because it's arbitrary capricious. I really think that um, that comment in the petition's brief was an unforced error. Other uh, panelists here, John, Michael? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, at the outset, not an administrative lawyer and certainly not a tax lawyer. I mean, I don't even do our taxes at, at, at home. My wife does the taxes, uh, so I won't get too in the weeds. I will, I will say maybe the issue isn't, isn't as much the injury, but redressability, right? It's not like an APA limit. It's just Article 3, right? Like, well, how could you redress the injury of not getting access or not having your comments considered if you just didn't exist at the time? Um, so it just seems sort of tricky, and there's a lot to unpack. <clears throat> There is some tax recent tax authority because the that the, uh, a case Hewitt for example is a recent tax court case where um, the the court simply said the the regulation violated notice and comment and therefore it's not applicable to the taxpayer in the case. Michael, no, I do think there is. I'm not sure if this is exactly responsive to that, but but the. Uh... This notion of like facial and as applied, which I think ties into the notice and comment aspect of stuff that gets, and I think yesterday's argument showed this, there's like a lot of unclarity and confusion about what people mean. Sometimes it means who's on which side of the V, right? Justice Kavanaugh did that in his PDR concurrence, PDR networks concurrence. Uh, other times people mean like you're a defendant and as applied means you, you're not actually raising a claim, you're raising an affirmative defense. And this didn't, I, I wish someone had said this at argument, but there is no statute of limitations for affirmative defenses. So the notion that you have a claim that could be barred by, by makes no sense. Like, because an affirmative defense is not a claim, there's nothing to limit that when you bring it up. And that's an important doctrinal point that I think was missed yesterday. And then um, the government seems to use this to mean like, and I think this is Professor Morse's usage too, to mean if there's like, uh, if the circumstances of the plaintiff matter to the case, uh, and I, that's how the government puts it at least. Maybe that's not, maybe I'm misremembering something from your article, Judy, but like the, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because no case is like that. Uh, you always have to show that you've been 
adversely affected or aggrieved or suffered a legal wrong, you have to have an injury in fact, right? There are lots of APA cases going back to like toilet goods where, you know, someone wasn't allowed to bring a suit because, you know, they, they uh, even, even though everything else, there's final agency action, but they didn't have a, a ripe claim or standing or whatever. So in that sense, everything's as applied because everything ties into the plaintiff's situation in some respect or another. I just have never quite understood that distinction. I think that maps on to some extent with the procedure versus substance uh, uh, thing. I, I, I wouldn't draw that distinction. I wouldn't introduce that distinction into how I read the statute. I actually have a question from the audience that I think uh, follows on this discussion quite nicely. Uh, it's directed uh, to Professor Morris. Um, and uh, and it and it's it, it begins with the statement and then I'll get to the question. So it says uh, the Professor Morris argues that the oh I should say this from John Lesueur. I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, right in our audience. Um, Professor Morris argues that the petitioner's argument is too strong to differentiate between procedural claims, um, which uh, versus substantive claims. I'm editing here a little bit on the fly. Um, then the question is, isn't the government's argument too strong to allow for ultra vires claims that are brought more than six years after the final agency action? Um, maybe you want to say those don't get brought or maybe there's maybe there's an out there. Professor Morris. I think there's an out. I'm going to go back to the language of uh, 706, which allows a reviewing court to hold unlawful and set aside an agency action. Um, and in the case, which uh, is maybe the paradigm as applied case where the government is enforcing the laws, entering into an enforcement action, that's the government action. So I think that in, in that sense, then that the as applied piece actually works quite well with the government's uh, argument, which uh, Justice Kagan again um, emphasized that the question is, when do you have all the elements of the claim? If what you're arguing is that the government er injured me in this enforcement action, then one of the elements of the claim is that injury, you know, the the the, the tax audit uh, or and and so forth. Um, so that doesn't seem so problematic to me. I, I think that it is a little bit more difficult to um, to see why the as applied piece is better is is, is I mean um, is different. I mean to say and accrues properly later uh, in the case um, of um, like an Allen v. Wright example of a plaintiff suing not only uh, uh, the person that harmed them, but also the government that made the regulation that caused the person to harm them. And I gave that Title IX example of a plaintiff suing a university and the Department of Education. There maybe it's a little bit more difficult to see because it's the university, for example, that has hurt the plaintiff. Um, but the argument has to be, okay, but the, 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 the reason that the government gets into the case is because the government's regulation caused the third party to harm the plaintiff, and that happened currently and later, and it's that action that produces the, the cause of action and begins the, um, the limitations period running. Okay, other panelists want to comment on that issue? John or Michael? I'll just point out that enforcement actions are not um, usually considered to be final agency action by an agency. So it doesn't, that doesn't. So you'd have to wait for the enforcement action yeah. to be done and then seek right. judicial review. Yeah. Once yeah, but even like a court action against you is not final agency action. But then you could raise it as a defense. You could, yes, but it's not the notion that you would then get a restart. Sometimes the government says like, oh, that's the new thing. They're kind of, they go back and forth about this if you read their brief. Um, in different cases, it's a strange it's a strange point uh, for them to make, I think. But yeah, I think they 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 raised issues like FOIA and other things like that, which I think I think they have an answer to. Which is their answer would be, well, let's say we had some old regs about FOIA, and maybe they're suspect. Maybe we did something wrong with those regs. But when you apply for get certain information out of the government, the government says no. That's a new final agency action. And then all bets are, you know, then you can raise any any claim that you you want to. Uh, frankly, I think that's a little bit of a big concession. I'm not so sure all the lower courts think that that's the way this uh, statute of limitations works. They they might be willing to to bar some of those arguments, but I, I think the government's willing to 
to throw that under the bus. Is that right, Professor Morris? I see you might be. Yeah, I am. I am thinking okay. about that. Um, I I think that what as I read the precedent when in an as applied action, um, it an as applied action doesn't open up, for example, the claim that notice and comment was faulty. It doesn't okay. do that. Right. And it, it, it opens up the ultra vires claims for sure. And then as we saw in oral argument yesterday, there's uh, some back and forth about whether an arbitrary and capricious claim is a procedural claim or is it closer to an ultra vires claim? And I think it's the former, but there was back and forth about that. But just if sort of just staying with notice and comment on the one hand and ultra vires on the other, um, there's a uh, case law uh, you know, in both the second and the ninth circuits, uh, really good clear facts that uh, uh, at least in those two circuits, that an enforcement action um, it does not open up a, 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 a kind of a pure administrative procedure claim, but it would open up the ultra vires claim. That makes sense to me because, and if if a if an agency applies a regulation and that violates a statute, I think there should be a cause of action later on. Well, that raises another question from an audience. I mean, member. if you fail to go through notice and comment, that violates the APA, which is a statute. Yes. That is true, but there is no new procedural action later that starts the clock running again. And in addition, the policy argument for starting the limitations period earlier for administrative procedure claims, I think, is um, particularly strong to start it and then close it. Well, I think I know the answer that people will give to this question, um, but I want to read the question from the audience. Um, the question from the audience says that um, could interpreting the Little Tucker Act uh, to prevent pre-enforcement challenges on ultra vires grounds raise constitutional questions. Possibly uh, the Chief Justice might have suggested that, although I think it's quite ambiguous, that portion of the oral argument. Um, and so I wanted to ask about that. Now, obviously, this is this this question is focused just on the pre-enforcement. We're not talking about if the government comes after you. Yeah, you can definitely raise the ultra virus claim. But could it be that it's there's a constitutional question or given that we uh, construe statutes to avoid even serious constitutional questions? Um, is there a serious constitutional question that curtailing pre-enforcement rule uh, uh, review on ultra vires grounds is, is problematic. That's the question from the audience, not my question. So um, John or Michael, do you want to lead off on that? I keep I keep picking on my fellow professor. Um, uh, several several of the questions were directed to her, which I always view as a good thing. I think if you if you get a lot of questions, people people are engaged with your your ideas. I'm having a good time with this panel. This is great. John, you want to go? I guess, I mean, I guess the question is, is it a constitutional avoidance issue or, or something like that? And and, and maybe um, as part of that, right, it, it sort of drives home the point that it's sort of weird to say that the same word has different meanings depending on the claim that's that's at issue, right? Because there's nothing in the, in the text of 2401A that distinguishes between the types of claims. Um, and I think the sort of tangential issue, right, that, that raises the issue of if you have canons of like avoidance or the rule of lenity, right, that apply in, in one context in which the statute is applied, whether that means you also have to have it in another context. I think Judge Sutton actually has an opinion about this, too, about how if you have a, a statute that has multiple applications, one of them criminal, other civil, and if you apply the rule of lenity in the criminal context, uh, like whether you also take that same meaning in the civil context, too. So maybe maybe that's a bit tangential, but um, that was my reaction. <clears throat> yeah, I I agree with that. And I also think the um, if you look at ex parte young, right, it it does say that if you fail to raise, um, if you fail to allow that kind of pre enforcement review, that can run into a a, a due process issue. Um, and I think you know Thunder Basin, some of these other cases suggest much the same. Uh, and it's consistent with the kind of underlying Grund norm for interpreting the APA, which came up a lot yesterday. Of like, this is a, this is an, a judicial review favoring statute, has a strong presumption. The court says in Abbott Labs and other cases, in favor of judicial review. And one of the things that's always struck me about the response is, you know, oh, we need to curtail this. Is like, I, why are we afraid of too much judicial review? Uh, it, that doesn't. That seems odd to me. Um, it's very hard to be an agency. I, I get that. 
Um, and it's hard to defend a bunch of suits. And uh, I've done that before. Um, and uh, nevertheless, uh, it seems like if an agency is breaking the law and that's harming you, uh, you should at least have a chance to go to court. Um, and to the extent that the statutory construction um, is up in the air, which I don't think it is, but to the extent it is, I do think that that constitutional norm and the APA norms put a thumb on the scale, pointing it towards more judicial review and not less. So I have a question, not from the audience, but I think I'm going to take us even a little bit more broadly because it, there are a lot of other cases on administrative law up at the court this year, um, this term, I should say. And I thought one of the most interesting things uh, in oral argument was Justice Jackson's question, uh, which I think described the Chevron doctrine exclusively in the past tense. Um, for court tea leave readers to, you know, this, this, you know, had my ears just lighting on fire when I was listening to the oral argument live. Uh, she said, you know, uh, the question was, would there be more upticks in litigation uh, if, if the court um, changed the, or, or, or said that the uh, petitioners are right about how they read the statute? And they said, well, maybe the, the petitioner said, no, the Sixth Circuit had its rule. And one of the arguments Justice Jackson said was, or question says, well, maybe there was no sort of avalanche of cases because we had uh, we had other doctrines. You know, for example, the sh Chevron existed, you know, past tense. And, and I, I thought like, oh, really? It did exist, um, past tense. Um, I, I, I think that that's uh, uh, very interesting. I have a forthcoming article and also in the George Mason Law Review from a symposium. I've, I've been against Chevron since the early, since the late 90s, never thought it was very good doctrine. So I, I would like to see it tossed overboard. But did any other people think this was a, a tell and this is part of, you know, the, and, I, and I also, with respect to this case, I thought it was actually a, a, perhaps a brilliant maneuver by Justice Jackson because I think that the chief justice more than all the other justices cares about stability and not seeming too radical. And if in fact, Justice Jackson uh, knows and, and that Chevron's is being not overruled so much as, as disavowed because the, the, the answer, the, the outcome in the case is still probably correct. Uh, Paul Clement actually said they expressly agree that, that, that there's no challenge to the outcome, but it's the, the framework is being gotten rid of. If that's true, I think maybe this is a great question from Jackson, who seems sort of favorable to the government's position, because it, it does suggest that keeping this statute of limitations will allow the court to overrule Chevron, but not, not destabilize things too much. So I, I wonder, first of all, if people think this was a kind of tell in the oral argument, and second of all, uh, whether they think it was this, I, I think perhaps brilliant gambit on Justice Jackson's point uh, to sort of try to get uh, a, what could be a swing vote in this case. Well, well, since there's silence, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Professor Morris. Uh, well, I I also noticed that later in the argument, um, Justice Kagan took care to try to walk that back. She asked a question about Chevron, but was very very careful to frame it in the if hypothetical um, format. Um, you, you know, I I, I think um, this the 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 focus on Chevron has been very interesting I think because of course there's so much else going on at the court with respect to administrative law it's always been a set as I think Professor Duffy has suggested a couple times this hour of an of overlapping doctrines that interact with each other and um I guess what I would say is I think her point if, if we take that point to be as a descriptive matter if we unleash one doctrine and then others at the same time, we may really have an unpredictable mess on our hands. And that would be you know, more risky than simply relaxing one of them and keeping the other one where it is. That seems descriptively correct to me. Um, so I guess I, if that's what she was doing, I think that I liked it. 
I'll also just say if it was if it was a ploy to get the chief to go to her side, it seems like he did not take it because he seemed almost the most strongly in favor of the petitioner. Uh, like his reaction, like why wasn't this decided sixty years ago? Um, so that was that yeah, was I good. I agree with that. I also, if I'm gonna, you know, say who's wearing the strategic cap, is it Kagan or is it uh, Justice Jackson? I suspect Kagan is the more of an op more of an operator, but that's just speculation. Um, I think Chevron's been dead at the court for a long time. So, you know, from that perspective, they did have Chevron, but when's the last time they had a Chevron case that was a Chevron case? It's been a very long time. Like, I don't know, FCC versus Fox or something like that? It's, it's been a while. Um, I guess Kaiser sort of talked about Chevron like it was still alive. Um, but since then, it's been ignored, kind of like the lemon test or something like that. So I... I I didn't read into it too much because I think it's also just it's a way of speaking about it. Like we we did have it, you know, in, in previous cases, but it's up for grabs and everyone knows that. Um, and I, I just interpret it as her saying, you know, much the same as Kagan, just slightly less precisely. Um, I don't think it was too much of a tell. I think there's a pretty good chance that Chevron goes. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far you're going to go. I'm not sure what happens to the next bubble rule. I mean, it seems to me that that's probably still going to be okay, but I'm just guessing at that point. Yeah, well, I, I think if you actually look at the details of the Chevron case, uh, first of all, it, it it was promulgated by Justice Gorsuch's mother. That's the actual rule that was at issue and, and, and unanimously upheld by the court. I, I, I don't think Justice Gorsuch is going to join an opinion that says uh, Ann Gorsuch was behaving illegally. Um, I think there's other, the reasoning of Chevron is, is really the problem. The, the implicit delegation theory is, is especially a good target given that the government in its brief explicitly quoted the explicit uh, delegation of, of rulemaking power that the agency in that case had. Um, but I, I, I don't want to get this too off on Chevron. One of the things I think is a theoretical issue that uh, maybe just a it's about how the court should think about lower court precedent. Um, and and uh, Professor Morris, this is going to come to you, uh, this question. I, I think I gave it to you in advance, so it's uh, you're, you're well primed for it. But one of the things that when I was clicking on the court that I found most amazing was how little the Supreme Court typically cared about lower court precedent. Um, you can see that in their opinions. They they don't often, they cite their own opinions very, very highly. They don't cite circuit court opinions very much, um, especially if you exclude citations that that where it's just a statement of the facts that says this is why there's a split and, you know, there's a footnote that gives the split. Um, but you said in your uh, George Mason Law Review article, the old regs article, you said that the lower court case law neither provides a careful examination of the statutory text nor considers the policy issues presented by the limitations period. So I, I guess I wonder how much should the court care about this, you know, I think certainly lopsided uh, lower court case law that is in favor of the government. Should they care about that a lot or or should they look at that as well, a lot of that didn't look at the statutory text. It's from an earlier era when you know, many courts didn't look at the statutory text too carefully, uh, or should they just, you know, weigh that with with some sort of stare decisis metric, even if it's not their own their own uh, jurisprudence or their own precedent? Yeah, the 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 article certainly does say that. Of course, it was you know it's intended as a friendly amendment. Uh, the, the you the courts of the, the lower courts may not have had the energy to fully provide a reasoned explanation. So I will seek in this article to help you out. Um, uh, but it's certainly true that that doesn't, the, 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 wor the words are still not there. There's some policy that, you know, the examples of um, Wind River and Shiny Rock and, and Sutton in her, uh, I think are um, uh, exemplars of that. But the textual analysis has historically not been a big, um, a big focal point. Um, so I think that what I think I heard at an oral argument, both in the, you know, why hasn't this been resolved? We've had six decades to do it. And in the um, the Thomas exchange, looking for any court that had uh, decided the way that the government, um, excuse me, the way that the petitioners wanted uh, was 
I think a curiosity about why it was that the lower courts had done what they had done. And I thought I heard a fair amount of seeking on the part of the justices to try to understand why that would be the case. If they are frustrated because the lower courts didn't say exactly why, I can understand I can understand that too, but um, that's kind of how I read them as as trying to kind of respect what this weight of precedent was and also looking for the explanation for it. Other panelists? They did yeah, I mean, I, Go ahead, John. I was going to say, I mean, I remember having dug through all these cases way back when in writing my note, and there definitely was not much, uh, really, if any, look, reasoning based on the text. It was basically Wind River did some sort of policy analysis, and lots of other circuits sort of just cited Wind River and it took it without really any further thought. Um, so I think if you're the Supreme Court, right, you know, maybe if it's a lower court opinion that's very well reasoned, you know, that can, that can be persuasive. Um, but I don't think we have that in, in this case. I think that's why your academic advisor thought it was a good note yes. topic, if I, if I recall correctly. Yes. yes. Uh, Michael? I agree. I, it's not that they have, like, weak text. They don't have any textual analysis at all. They don't. They just sort of assume the issue and move on, uh, or they have a policy basis for rewriting it. Very curiously, that Wind River was a Judge O'Scanlan opinion, which Judge O'Scanlan is not some squishy, you know, um, purposivist kind of guy. Um, so it was a, it, it's an odd, it's an odd thing. Uh, I've never figured out why, what he thought was, was good about that. Um, well, maybe I can, uh, maybe I, I, we've got one minute left or at most two, maybe we should do, um, uh, I, you know, and, and actually on just that point, I'd say, you know, I do think there's been this gigantic shift in 40 years of, you know, the left favoring judicial review and the right skeptical. And I think that's clearly the other way now, but rapid fire, your prediction, put you on the spot. Um, let's go in alphabetical order. Uh, uh, Michael Bushbacher. Uh, it's going to be 6-3. It's going to be focused on uh, the text of uh, right of action first to cruise. John. That's it. Yep. Same prediction um, with the majority written by Chief Justice Roberts and the dissent written by Justice Kagan. So I'll even give you the, the justices too. Susan. I think the government can get to five with Kagan, Sotomayor, and Jackson, plus Thomas, who really, I think, was troubled by the fact that there was not a case in the lower courts on the government on the uh, petitioner side, excuse me. Then one of Barrett Kavanaugh or Roberts, and I would think likely Barrett or Kavanaugh, um, but I think the government can pull this one out. All right, I think I am ending on time, which uh, the Federal Society will think that I'm a decent moderator. <laughs> on behalf of the Federal Society, thank you all for joining us for this great discussion today. Thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned. Thank you.